if you like, the genius of Islamic art, if we can use that term, continues in spite of these, mm-hmm. uh, in spite of these changes, or these regime changes. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that, that allows us to see a continuity between, say, 17th century and, and the 7th century, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, having said that, I don't want to suggest that there are no differences between, say, the format of palaces in the Ottoman world from the format of palaces in the Mughal Indian world. They are laid out in different ways, uh, according to different understandings of what kingship is, for example. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone. So Simon, thank you so much for joining us on The No Show. I'm really pleased to to have you on. Um, Could you sort of briefly give us an introduction into your background and and sort of um, your work at at SOAS and what you do? Sure, excuse me. Well, thank you for having me, first of all. It's... uh... Well, as I said to you before, it's flattering to be here um, you, uh, and um, it's very nice that you should host me in this way. So thank you uh, for having me. Um, I got into Islamic art through the benefit of being able to travel. So by having the right kind of passport, the right kind of body, um, I, I was and finances, I was able to travel uh, as a student. And when I came across the Islamic art of Morocco, I was completely blown away by it and um, most of all the cities of, this, of, of, the, of Morocco. And that made me want to learn Arabic, and um, which then led to me wanting to return to live in Morocco again, which I did for a few years. And then that made me want to go even deeper into the topic by doing a PhD in the subject. But I didn't want to do a PhD in Islamic art history as such, because I wanted to know more about the Islam that of Islamic art. You know, we, we talk about Islamic art, but very often the very Islam bit of Islamic art gets uh, left outside the door of the classroom. And I wanted to know about the Islam bit. So I did a PhD in Islamic studies, uh, well, Middle Eastern studies. Um, and out of that came my first book, which was on uh, the city of Fez in Morocco. And then um, I got a job in Kuwait, where I taught for about five, five, six years. I then got a research position at at Utrecht in Holland on a very exciting uh, uh, research program into the here and hereafter in the Islamic world. Uh, So lots of engagement with Al-Ghaib, this unseen world of Islam. And from there, I I, I managed to get a job at SOAS. Um, So, so, um, so, I mean, it it seems like you've, you've had a really sort of interesting um, journey with with Islamic art and just is Islam in general. Um, so could could you sort of elaborate a bit more about that first interaction that you had uh, in Morocco with with Islamic art? It was really in many ways the form of the city that that that, that, that hit me. That um, how everything was organised in a way that was completely alien to, to to how I understood urban space should be. I was I, I was mesmerized by this space where it was so easy to get lost and um, I wanted to know more about it. The art itself, um, well, you, so it was hidden. I mean, it, you know, if, if, you, if you're traveling in Morocco, you can't go into the mosques, for example, if you're a non-Muslim. So there was much about it that was tantalizing to me. I could sense something that was intriguing and I was certainly intrigued by the, the, the urban, uh, structure of the cities but I also knew that there was something tantalizing behind these walls which uh, a I couldn't go into as a non-Muslim in, in if there were mosques but also I think there's something about that play 
uh, even if within architecture as a whole, that in Morocco at least and North Africa as a whole, stuff is hidden mm. behind uh, blank walls. Mm. Uh, it, it's a it's a culture where uh, you don't display your glory on on the outside. Mm -hmm. Now that's not true. That's certainly not true of all Islamic art, uh, um, but it is certainly true of of North African. Islamic art and other uh, other areas of, of of the Islamic world, but it is not. I wouldn't want to say that all Islam doesn't. All of Islamic art is not about displaying the beauty on the outside, but certainly it is true of North Africa and specifically of, of Morocco. And I was just fascinated by this uh, this modesty, um, and that's what I wanted to pursue in my. That's what I pursued in my PhD. So trying I'm, to understand this, uh, with having having sort of gained this this um, these insights into. Islamic art and the way it is um, sort of conceived. Um, how much, I mean, from a historical perspective, how much has that been impacted by the various um, sort of empires and rulers of the Islamic world? And how, 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 how much influence have they had? Well, you know, we, we mentioned this in, in our chat and I was uh, at the start before we started recording and I was thinking when you spoke about these, um, these rulers and these empires, and I, I would have said that in certain ways, they don't have much impact, that Islamic art continues on a trajectory. Not, it's not always the same, but it's a trajectory that begins quite early and it just sort of wends its way. And it is not necessarily impacted by, by uh, the changes of dynasties. Um, and I think that it's a mistake to look to dynasties and, and root new empires and, and then project that onto the art. I don't know that there's too much compelling evidence to think that a new empire, a new dynasty impacts the, the, the art. Um, I think one needs to, I, I'm just not, I, I think in some ways the, 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 the uh, what is, what characterizes uh, Islamic art, which I'm not going to go into say what characterizes Islamic art because it's, it's capacious, but the, if you like the genius of Islamic art, if we can use that term, continues in spite of these, mm -hmm. uh, in, in spite of these changes, these regime changes. Mm -hmm. um, and and that, that allows us to see a continuity between say 17th century and, and the seventh century, for example. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, I don't want to suggest that there are no differences between say, the format of palaces in the Ottoman world from the format of palaces in the Mughal Indian world. They are laid out in different ways. Uh, according to different understandings of what kingship is, for example. But in terms of the kind of uh, objects that m regular Muslims were buying in the marketplace, or um, I don't know that you would find, you could really say, ah, oh, that's a Mughal piece, uh, a Mughal domestic item, as opposed to an Ottoman domestic item. Mm -hmm. um, if that, so, you know, at, at, the, at the level of, material that is used in a daily life by Muslims, I don't know that you would be able to say that uh, when, when this or that empire came in, these, uh, this kind of art changed. Um, so, so I think from, from what I'm, I'm getting from you is that, that there, there's, a, there's an essence to Islamic art that's sort of, um, that's, that's overarching and, and it's, it's, it continues. And as you said, it, it sort of continues on this trajectory. Obviously, one of the imp most important symbols and, um, you know, um, I guess, images of, of the Islamic world is the Kaaba, which you've written a book on. Um, before we get into the details of the book, which I really want to do, um, what, what, what sort of drove you to, to want in to view the Kaaba as, as an artistic image, as opposed to its function as a holy site. I don't really draw that distinction. I'm not sure that, I'm not even, I'm not too sure that the term art, which is a, 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 obviously essential to history of art, if, you, if, you're, if you're an art historian as I am, the term art is kind of essential. And yet it is a term that's increasingly uh, in, under investigation now. I'm not, and what one, because in many ways it's been defined by uh, modern Europe, uh, in the 17th and 18th and 19th century, and then applied to other cultures, or looked for in other cultures, and I'm not too sure that it, uh, it that it's it, that it's helpful. 
where certain philosophers of, of art have um, spoken of, of art as something that has effect in the world, that, do, that, that, it, that art does something. It mm -hmm. creates a world, it opens up a world, it, um, it changes how we think about how we see things. So, and I think that in that sense, we can talk about the Kaaba um, as art. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm an art historian and I wanted to, to, and I wondered why it hadn't been counted as art. And in fact, the Kaaba had been dismissed by uh, some very senior Islamic art historians as being a rather crude, rudimentary uh, structure that didn't really merit their attention um, as art historians. And so I, I wanted to think about it. I wanted to look at what does this building enable for the Islamic world? What, what are its effects in the Islamic world? Uh, I think you make this really um, interesting um, uh, observation that um, Islamic historians have always been looking into the Kaaba from an outside perspective and how they interact with it or how they perceive it, as opposed to how Muslims have perceived it historically and how they engage with it. So what, what, what did you sort of um, observe and, and um, uh, sort of find out in, in, this, in this research that you've done? Well, um, A, what you just said is absolutely right, is, you know, if you're, if you're an Islamic art historian, for the most part, you don't belong to the Islamic culture and you can't visit it. And indeed, neither have I visited it. Um, but it means that you certainly, at best, you can explain the building. You can flatten it out uh, to take that etymology of expl explain, but you'll never really understand it if you're on the outside. Um, and, I tr and in my work, I very much try to understand an object or a building in terms of the culture which it, which generated it, um, and I quite and I think I quite literally mean that to understand. I I try to feel like get into the building, get underneath it, get into its logic, um, and I've tried to do that with all the work I do. I try to inhabit the logic of this building in the case of the Kaaba or the city in the case of my first book, um, and so I try to inhabit the logic of the Kaaba by think by by looking at what it does and has done in the Islamic world. So I, I, you know, I try to see how Muslims have written about this uh, over the centuries. And the literature is huge. Uh, you know, it's the, 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 amount of, the amount of writing that has been devoted to the Kaaba uh, by, uh, by Muslims is just sort of overwhelming. And I do not pretend to have uh, covered all the literature, mm. far from it. Um, but I, I just, I've chosen, I've chosen, I kind of selected, I, I, at one point I realized I've just got to get this book published. So, you know, six chapters, but I, you could have gone and written 10 chapters about how it's understood in the Islamic world. I chose six uh, themes for how it's understood, but that's only in a way the, the tip of the iceberg. Um, mm. And, and the way I do that is simply I look at how it's been written about in the text, how it's been uh, painted in miniature paintings, how it's been um, uh, uh, spoken about in poetry, in Sufism. I sort of look at a whole range of, mm. of, uh, of places, textual, philosophical, historical, uh, painterly, and from that try and draw out conclusions about what this building has done in the past and is doing today in the Islamic world. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting that you point to poetry because poetry has a significance to the Kaaba, given that, you know, pre-Islam, it was where the, the Mu'allagat were, were hung, the, 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 the greatest poems perceived by the, Arab, the Arabs, the greatest poems in Arab, Arabic history were hung on the Kaaba, which obviously one shows the fact that the Arabs had an in, exceptionally important sort of relationship with poetry but two that why would you hang it on the Kaaba what's the significance of the Kaaba for you to hang it there um and so it, it, it does there are these these incredible sort of um areas about the Kaaba that as a Muslim uh, and I'll be completely honest aren't discussed aren't aren't sort of um aren't um looked at in depth and it, this is why I think that the work that, that you've done is really really fascinating for Muslims and non-Muslims alike, because, you know, you, you present this um, alternative 
a viewpoint on on the Kaaba. So talk to us a bit a bit more about sort of these these um, six sections or six chapters that that you've you've come up with. Well, uh, again, uh, just to comment on, on, on what you just said, I, I, you know, I agree with you entirely about um, these, this, 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 the, the obvious importance that the Kaaba had in the pre-Islamic period because of this, of it, because of it's, it's said to have been the place where these great poems were, were hung. I should add that um, even early in, even in the 10th or the 11th century, not every Muslim believed that story, but certainly it's come down to us that the Ma'alakat were hung in, in these, in the in the building because it was a building of such importance to the pre-Islamic uh, Arabs uh, living in Central Arabia at the at the time, and it, it re, of course it retains that huge importance to the point that um, it's the qibla of the Islamic mm -hmm. world. You know, people whenever you uh, whenever a Muslim uh, performs the ritual prayer, the salat, they have to turn to they have to face the Kaaba in their mind. They have to physically. Uh, orient themselves towards it, uh, and, but not just when they do the ritual prayer. When, when, for example, they uh, a butcher is slaughtering an animal, it, the, the head of the animal should be turned in the direction of of, of the Kaaba. When the body is buried, a Muslim's a body is buried, the head of the of, of the Muslim's body should be facing towards the Kaaba. I mean, the it, it, the um, you just you get a sense already of just how important this building is because it quite literally orients so much of a Muslim's daily life, uh, and um, so my first chapter is about that. It's about th what the Kaaba does in terms of its, in terms of the fact that it's the qibla, that it's the direction to which Muslims orient so much of their daily life, um, and. Uh, one thing that I find there that I think I don't think is well known, certainly not well known outside of academia, is that whole cities were oriented towards the Kaaba, mm -hmm. not just the mosques, but um, whole cities were attempted to be oriented towards the Kaaba in the very early period, even if the, even if in practice it wasn't always possible that there was a desire to orient the entirety of a city towards the Kaaba. Now, this is a huge expense um, to do that, a great, and, a great and, and, and a task that's very greatly difficult. And I think the fact that kings and rulers occasionally tried to do this, or did try to do this in the early period, indicates just how important they, uh, they thought it was for Muslims to remain oriented throughout their life, throughout their daily life, towards the Kaaba. Um, mm -hmm. I also look at, in a related vein to that, I look at um, how in these early Islamic sources, the Kaaba is spoken of as the place that is not just the center of the world, not just the navel, but is actually the place where the world is birthed from, its matrix. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's lots of interesting uh, uh, traditions. They're not, they're not prophetic hadiths, but they're traditions uh, that, that go back uh, to a very early period, certainly, that talk of the world being birthed from the Kaaba, and there are um, plentiful uh, paintings of the Islamic world. These are kind of cosmographies that have been summarized in the form of uh, slightly fantastical to our scientific eyes, but to the, in the Islamic world, not fantastical, I think, but these cosmographies, these mappa mundis, these mm -hmm. maps of the whole world, where the Kaaba is dead center, at, uh, um, and almost seems to be generating the world as if it were a, a kind of matrix mm -hmm. at the center of the world. So, uh, so I look at, um, I look at, so that's a kind of, that, so, I look, that's, so that's another chapter. Another chapter is on what happens when the Kaaba has been destroyed. Mm -hmm. We know that the Kaaba has been rebuilt on a number of occasions because uh, Mecca is a uh, in the is in the bot is in the is in the at the bottom of a very steep valley where flooding occurs, and sometimes this flooding can be incredibly intense, and the building can get destroyed. Equally, uh, there have been rulers and um, potential and people who wanted to try to gain. Does gain control of Mecca, who have um, destroyed the Kaaba uh, by warring in Mecca. They have advert, they have inadvertently or de or purposefully destroyed the Kaaba. Yeah. And I've been quite interested to know. Well, what if the building is destroyed? 
what happens to a culture that says the building is their axis mundi? You know, what happens and why don't we get these um, laments for the destroyed Kaaba in the way that, for example, in Judaism, you get the laments for the destruction of the first and second temple of Jerusalem. So I look into that think, and so I look into that and, and find that um, in many ways, what matters more about the Kaaba is the fact that are its awesome, unnatural, extraordinary foundations mm -hmm. which um, matter. And, those, and, so it doesn't, and, it, and, it, and that it doesn't matter what stands on the surface, what really matters are these foundations of the Kaaba, which have remained unchanged since, uh, according to tradition, the time that, that Adam built the Kaaba uh, uh, in, in legendary biblical times. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, you, you sort of point to these really, really interesting sort of um, both historical um, events and um, general concepts of, of the, the Kaaba. And one of the things that you mentioned earlier on was that you looked at sort of the, the significance or, or, or the lack of significance. Um, I don't know, you can explain, but of the, of the, the fabric that covers the Kaaba. Yep. Uh, well, I, I, indeed, I have a, I know I do, a, it's such an important part of the Kaaba. I think you can't, you need to think of this robe, it, of this robe. So I, I spend, a, 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 I, I devote at least one chapter, um, and in, in many ways, half of, a pre, of another chapter on this robe. It's called the Kiswa, as of course you know, um, uh, which is best translated as robe, as clothing. And I look at what it, what it's, what it does. Um, on the cab, what, and how I look at how it operates. Again, my main, my main, if you like, you ask me about my methodology in my uh, articles, and I don't, it's not always clear if I have a kind of methodology. But in this, in this book, I very much do have a methodology. It's simple, and it's very simple. What does this building do? How is it working? Mm -hmm. And I applied exactly the same methodology to to this kiswa. What does this cloth? This cloth? How how is it working? Mm -hmm. on the Kaaba. So I look at it and I look at uh, how it's uh, elevated at certain points of the, at, at just before the Hajj period, how it's uh, then re, how it's taken off uh, just uh, and changed just at the end of the Hajj, and then how it's elevated in a strange way immediately after the Hajj is over. So I look at these moments when the Kiswa is raised, sometimes cut, lowered in strange uh, ways up until the, even up until the middle of the 20th century. And I, I argue that, um, that, this, that these particular patterns that the Kiswa is given around the Hajj period, the, the particular ways that it's hung during the Hajj period, indicates something quite specific about, um, about uh, how the Kaaba is imagined. And my argument is looking at the poetry, looking at travelers' accounts and looking at paintings, is that when it's hung in these strange ways, it is imagined by regular people, not by the rulers, not by the leaders, not by the people in charge of the Hajj, not by the ulema, not by the great scholars, but it's popularly imagined to be actually alive, that the building has become animated from within, that it has become a kind of uh, a shelter for some superabundant force. Um, mm -hmm. Now that, that comes, I need to be very careful here because I really am not saying that, that Saudi authorities would agree with this, quite the opposite. Um, but my evidence comes from the poetry, from traveler's accounts, from, from, like, from the little people um, mm -hmm. who, where this kind of imagination is spelt out in quite clear terms in what they've left us. Um, that, it is at, the, at a certain point of the year, the Kaaba is imagined to be a pilgrim and imagined to be the, some kind of shelter for something that, has, that is super abundant, divine. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's very, I mean, one of the, the um, you sort of uh, mentioned obviously the, the Kiswa, but I wonder that the Kaaba, I mean, having seen it firsthand and having you know, experienced it, the Kaaba does have really remarkable sort of features. In, do you look at the, in like sort of the, do you, 
um, focus on these individual features or do you look at it as just as just the, the building itself? I look at the, you, I certainly do, in this chapter on the Kiswa, I certainly spend a good check section talking about the decorations on the, on, on the Kiswa. Because as you say, it's, it's, it's the most decorated part of the building and it's in many ways the most valuable part of the building. It's the most expensive part. Um, it's made of a silk, a very, very uh, elaborate form of silk, and it's woven, uh, it, and it's, it, it's embroidered with um, gold and silver threads mm -hmm. that, uh, the cost of which is, it, it, you know, is in, it's in the many millions. So I look at, um, I look at these elements, but my overall argument is how, the, how it as a whole operates. Not I don't spend too long looking at the individual verses of the uh, Quran that are written, for example, in the Tiraz band, which is the golden band at the top of the Kaaba on the Kiswa. I don't, I mean, I, I discuss it, I point, I kind of help the reader who doesn't know about this uh, cloth, this robe, I give them kind of the sort of basic information about it, what's written on it, uh, um, and uh, what's embroidered actually within the Kiswa, because the Kiswa itself is a source of writing. It's, uh, it's, it contains invocations and blessings upon the prophet, it, the God's name, and um, you know, it, it, so actually on the Kiswa itself, it's not just embroidered, but it's actually woven mm -hmm. with uh, calligraphic uh, inscriptions, mm -hmm. which are quite legible, um, and probably you've seen them. Mm -hmm. But overall, I'm looking at how the, this chapter is look at, I, I look at how the, how the Kiswa is hung through the, throughout the year. And it's hung in very particular ways, which uh, it seems up until uh, the end of the 20th century was still adhered to. Now at the end of the Hajj period, they don't hang it in a uh, serrated pattern like that, mm -hmm. which is how it's been hung uh, from what I can tell by looking at paintings for, 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 for centuries. Now they just, uh, they, anyway, you can see that they don't, they, it's hung in a different way. Um, so, uh, but to, so to answer your question, yes, I, I help the reader understand the, uh, what, what the Kiswa is made of and the writing that is on it. But when I'm looking at the function of the Kiswa, I'm looking at how it's hung. It's mm -hmm. um, how it's raised and lowered at a particular moment of, of the Islamic year. Is and it? how people have written about that. I mean, this is... I cannot emphasize, sorry, sorry, Zena. Oh, I just don't want you to think for a minute that this is, this is my imagination mm -hmm. of, 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 a, of a building that is perceived to be alive. It is very clear within the, um, within the accounts of travelers and it's very clear within the poetry that uh, at the popular level, when the building's kiswa just before the Hajj is elevated, it is imagined to be a pilgrim. It is said to be in its ihram, in its uh, okay. pilgrimage garb. Um, uh, and um, this is very widely attested in, in, uh, in textual accounts. Uh, I think it's very, I think it's really, really, it's very original to sort of discuss the, the hanging, the, the, the kind of hanging of, of the, of the kiswa. And it also just uh, sort of, I mean, again, as a Muslim, it's not something that is, it is some is something that we, I've paid attention attention to throughout the years in sort of looking at it from that this this perspective because historically you know you you if you go to if you go to Mecca or you go to Kaaba if you go to the Kaaba and you enter sort of the the the, the outer um sort of entrance and as you sort of walk into the Kaaba the Kaaba has this um the incredible sort of presence, um, but one of the things that I've found over the uh, over the over recent years is that it just feels like it's a bit different now because you know they've erected all these skyscrapers around the Kaaba, and that once upon a time you know you 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 stood next to the Kaaba and and it's kind of like you looked up to the heavens, and now it's sort of the surrounded by these skyscrapers which takes away in my opinion from this beauty so uh, it, it it has been an incredible sort of um shift in my opinion um 
but over the years, how has how how have people viewed the Kaaba? How has that changed in in your opinion or from your research? I I don't. I mean, I, I, personally, I don't think it has changed a great deal. But I should also say that my research is, in technical terms, it's synchronic. It is not diachronic. I'm not following a particular conceptualization of the Quran of, of the Kaaba across time. Um, I'm, I'm looking at different ways it has been conceptualized, but I don't then, I don't then uh, set that into history and say, well, that's how it was in the 17th century, but it is not in the 19th century. And certainly that will be a, a point of uh, contention that people will say, this is, you know, in a sense, you've, uh, you've taken these, these concepts uh, out of time. Um, uh, you know, and that's, you know, I, I, you know, in a sense, that is a valid, that is a valid criticism. This is not a book that traces uh, understandings across time, um, but takes major understandings. So I, I take the ways that it has been conceptualized at a major level. So Kibla, for example, is a major conceptualization of the Kaaba, right? Um, as a matrix of the world is another ma major conceptualization. As a, as the beloved, of 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 the uh, of a Sufi is another major conceptualization, but I don't tr I don't trace the development of this conceptualization, uh, how it ebbs and uh, ebbs and uh, how it rises and ebbs. Um, yeah, uh, and that that would certainly be a task to to, to do. I'm not aware that um, I'm not I, you know I, the idea of the Kaaba as being the beloved. Um, is a, a very ancient one. It, it, I, mean, I, I think that one would be able to take it way, take it right back to very early uh, Islamic poetry, mm -hmm. if, if not slightly earlier. Um, and I, you know, to plug this book again, I provide the evidence for that, and in also the secondary sources. I'm not a poetry specialist, um, but there are people who've written on this, um, and so I make a, a point of making their 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 uh work accessible i try and perhaps a bit like this podcast i want to provide a um a stage for these important texts uh, often just single articles that have got lost uh within academia but might be of great interest to i don't know maybe you or maybe some of your audiences mm. um, uh, so uh, and I, you know so the idea of the idea of sorry, the idea of the beloved then is an idea that we can trace we can trace back early days. I talk about how the Kaaba has been conceptualized as the heart um, mm -hmm. of uh, of humankind, and that also is an idea that we can trace. And, I, and odd enough, that one I do trace a little bit. That idea seems to come into existence around the ninth or tenth century, but really picks up in the thirteenth and fourteenth century with the likes of Rumi. Um, and uh, Ibn Arabi, and, um, where they talk about the, the Kaaba as being a kind of material object, but what really matters is the Kaaba of the heart. And so, uh, so that, but, but that again, I think, is a very well-established uh, trope or theme that hasn't changed. Um, people still talk about the Kaaba as uh, the heart of humankind. Um, uh, where, where can people get a hold of this book? Well, uh, it's available from Edinburgh University Press. It's quite expensive. Um, uh, there is a, uh, there is a, uh, but but, it, I mean, it, it's cost ninety five pounds. Uh, mm -hmm. But you you can buy it at, at, on Amazon for considerably less than that at the moment. It's uh, and it's possible, and one hopes that the book will go into paperback. Obviously, not this year because it's only just come out, but. Um, maybe next year so mm -hmm. a number of edinburgh university press books do have that trajectory they go from hardback to paperback within a year or two and i'm very much hope, hoping that the, the, that the book will do that because i think there are people um who don't have 60 or 95 pounds to spend but would like to spend maybe 20 pounds on a book that has been uh, beautifully produced by edinburgh the beautiful color photographs of um paintings and maps uh, that pertain to the Kaaba uh, and which also contains information that might be of interest to them in the same way that you're you've identified as a Muslim in this in, in this podcast and you've told us about you're going to Kaaba uh, going to Mecca now there might be many people who are interested in some of the kind of data that I've pulled out um, even if they don't agree with my overall 
uh, interpretations. That's absolutely fine. You know, you may well disagree with this reading of how the kiswa is elevated. You may say that's got nothing to do with it, Simon, and that's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. But you might still benefit. You might still get something from the data which I'm using. Of, uh, uh, and so I'm hopeful that the book will go into paperback so that it's not just uh, an not just a book that can be bought by a library or middle class people uh, absolutely absolutely and, and i think we we are we are definitely proponents of you know trying to make make these um sort of uh works that the academics like yourself who've put in you know an incredible effort into into bringing them to life and into bringing bringing them to light um accessible to you know a, a, anyone um and fingers crossed we 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 certainly hope that that it does um end up in uh, a paperback um format by the way what we'll do is we'll, we'll link it on the episode so that people can um, access it on on um amazon or wherever they might buy it from um where can people find you online um are you on twitter by any chance I, i'm not I, i'm afraid I, I i don't i don't even have a phone um <laughs> I don't even have a mobile phone. I'm sort of, I'm, well, I'm phone averse. I'm slightly phonophobic. But email, like, you know, if someone sends me an email at my work, at my, uh, work address, I, I really do respond pretty sharp, pretty quickly. Um, I, I like email uh, uh, and I use it and I respond quickly. I think people would agree with that, students and people who have tried to reach me. So that can be found at my, uh, at SOAS. So if you just Google, if you were to Google, for example, Simon O'Mara at SOAS, you would be taken to my web page in the Department of the History of Art and Archaeology, where you would get my email address. Um, I'd be happy to give it, if you wanted to put it as part of this podcast. Yeah, yeah well, I will, we'll, 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 we'll link it anyway, so, so people yeah. have instant access to it. Um, and just, just finally, what, what, what word of advice would you give to anyone that's looking to get into sort of Islamic um, art history? I, I would say that the field is no longer the uh, province of, uh, of non-Muslims and outsiders to the Islamic culture. That is changing, uh, that may, and, 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 and thankfully so. Uh, there are increasingly people who are Muslims, who have been, uh, who've grown up in the culture, even if they've grown up in that culture, say in Britain, say, they still have, a, they still have access to uh, seeing Islamic art, perhaps in ways that are different to art hist how Islamic art historians have seen it, you know, up until say the, the, the end of the 20th century. And whenever I teach um, Islamic art to students at SARS, I'm always looking, I'm always imploring any uh, self-identifying Muslim, so people with the hijabs, for example, um, I'm saying, you know, we, the field could really benefit from mm -hmm. the kind of knowledge that you have, uh, that you know, you've, you've experienced Islam, you know a lot about um, the kind of things that uh, I've spoken about earlier about how vision is, is domesticated. You know a lot about the, the important division between the seen and the unseen world, a raib or a shahada. Uh, come and give us your knowledge. Come and engage with your heritage uh, and uh, help exhibit it in the museums in a way that you think does it justice, um, that you think speaks to, its, uh, to, to what's Islamic about it. Um, uh, I, if, if one thing comes out of this podcast, if just one, if one identifying Muslim were to see this podcast, they can't, you know, I would like to, I'd like to own my heritage a little bit better rather than having presented by people I don't know in museums or in, uh, in mm -hmm. academia. I would love them to step forward. Um, it's, uh, it's vital, I think. I think that we have a different demographic. Uh, who are Islamic art historians. I Again, I, I do not mean to say that it is not changing. It is already changing. Yeah. But there is a sense that even today, the Islam of Islamic art is not that important, that it can somehow be bracketed and left outside the classroom or the museum. Um, and that that has to change, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think that this advice is fantastic. And I think um, you, you make an excellent point in, in sort of, saying take it you know referring to taking ownership of your culture and heritage and that's precisely what what this does so you know we i definitely agree with that and 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 support that um simon I, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you um i think your work is amazing and, and original and i hope anyone listening does um take the time to to 
um, you know, check out Simon's profile on SOAS and also take the time to just, you know, look at the book and see, see um, the interesting presentations in there. So, um, Simon, thank you so much for joining me and I'd love to have you on again sometime soon. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. And I, I, I wish this series the greatest success. And thank you for having me again. You flattered me and it's been a wonderful exchange um, as a result of your invitation. Thank you very much. All the very best. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute whatever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion and I'll make sure I get back to everyone.